Okay, hello and welcome again to another episode of Sacktown Talks. Today we're joined by Heidi Harmon and the Romero Institute. Heidi, how's it going and what are you up to? It's going great. I am, you know, just trying to save the world. That's all. <laughs> Let's get someone out there's trying. You know? Don't worry, everybody. I've got it handled. <laughs> good, good. We can go back to what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's great. That's great. Uh, Heidi, you know, can you, I guess, tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of the Romero Institute and how you found yourself there? Sure. Well, I've been a climate activist for probably getting close to 20 years now. And that led me to well, a lot of activism and then eventually led me to run for mayor of the city of San Luis Obispo. And I have been the mayor for the last five years here in San Luis Obispo. And in that time, we did do a lot on climate action, including I led the city to adopt at that time the most ambitious carbon neutrality goal of any city in the United States. Um, but recently, uh, I've been thinking about how much more there is to do. And after the uh, recent large climate report called the IPPC report came out that was very dire, um, my kid reached out to me in the middle of the night and was very upset and asking me, is, Mom, is this the apocalypse? Or is anyone doing anything about this? And I really felt called to do more. And so I stepped away from my role as mayor of San Luis and stepped up into the senior public affairs director of the Romero Institute Let's Green California initiative. And the Romero Institute itself has a, like a 50 year history of uh, justice work, um, really often coming from a legal perspective. So working on cases like the Karen Silkwood case, um, if you're familiar, she was a whistleblower in the nuclear industry to working on um, issues around Three Mile Island, the Pentagon Papers, Iran-Contra, and all kinds of incredibly significant legal cases throughout our recent political history. And so they have a long lineage of that. And in the last five years, they recognize like a lot of people that the climate crisis is the defining issue of our time. And so the Let's Green California initiative was born out of that concern around wanting to be part of the solutions to, the, to that issue. Well, you know, getting into this, uh, you know, 20 years ago, I guess kind of what, what was your thoughts then? Like what got you into this 20 years ago? So I, I do everything really um, it, out of the maternal, honestly. That's what it really comes down to for me. I really have organized my whole life um, to try and be the best mom I could. Even be well before I have kid, had kids, I have a degree in early childhood education, was a preschool teacher, did my senior project here at the Cal Poly University on homeschooling because I knew I wanted to homeschool my kids. And so I was a very um, intentional, I guess you could say, type of parent. And so I think that is in part why, uh, as we were calling it then, and global warming and climate crisis now really has uh, motivated me is because I recognize that it is going to directly impact my children's lives and potentially even end their lives. Right. Um, and so I want to, I, I don't feel comfortable personally not doing what I can to ensure that they have a, a viable future. I guess, how have you like stayed focused on this? Like 20 years ago, you know, you heard about global warming, you heard, you know, Al Gore talked about it, you drove a Prius, but it was kind of like, yeah, whatever, things pretty normal uh, to kind of you know, persevere through this, you know, 20 years, you know, now it's pretty evident. Like, you know, we have fires, we have these crazy storms all the time. Like, you know, people are scared now, but, you know, to go through that for the past 20 years, kind of what, what kept driving you to move forward? Well, I think in part because I um, accept the reality of science, you know, and, and e even 20 years ago from a non-scientific non perspective, it was really clear that this was going to be a significant problem. You know, the, the exact specificity of it has gotten more clear, but even 20 years ago, um, you could see it coming. And I, ha I, like I said, you know, I feel like my children's lives hang in the balance of what we do in these moments right now. And, um, I, as, an, as a mother, I just have remained committed. And, you know, just to, so people, maybe this will hopefully inspire people to get involved. You know, I, yes, I have a, a college degree, but at the time I got involved in climate ad advocacy, I was a single mom, I was a house cleaner, and I had no real uh, necessary 
uh, obvious experience in politics, advocacy, elected office, or any of that. And I think in some ways that's the silver lining or the gift of this crucial moment in history is that it really puts us all in a position of, um, first of all, having nothing left to lose, uh, sort of putting our backs up against the wall. And I think that's a time when people can really get inspired to step out and do what they can to make a difference. And so I didn't necessarily know what I was doing when I began, but I did eventually become the mayor of my city and make a huge impact on climate change and other interrelated issues. Mm -hmm. No, that's amazing. So mm -hmm. I guess, you know, you, you just kind of told us about the Romero Institute and kind of, yeah. you know, you mentioned the Let's Green California initiative. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about the Let's Green California initiative, kind of what you guys are, are working on right now? Sure. I think the main driver is really wanted to reestablish California as a global environmental and climate leader. You know, I think a lot of times we think we are, and when you really look at the policies and the progress that we've made, we still have a long, long way to go. I think your average Californian, you know, up until recently, myself included, don't have a real understanding that we are a major oil producing state ourselves. I think often we think of states like Texas or places like Saudi Arabia, not realizing that right here in our backyards, we're having, there's a lot of extraction, including fracking and other things that are dangerous for multiple reasons. And so we're calling on the governor to declare a state of climate emergency um, to really make that kind of visionary statement to name what is true is that we are in the middle of a historic emergency that would, I think, really send the message to the rest of California and hopefully, hopefully the rest of the country and therefore the world that we are going to restake our claim as global climate leaders and really lead the charge in, in addressing this issue. You know, I guess it's interesting timing with this with this interview with you know everyone in Scotland, the governor, and a mm. lot of legislative delegation yeah. uh, meeting there with Scotland with the other world leaders. You know, there's kind of one thought of oh, we're just one state and a big nation. What what can we do? Kind of how, how do you respond to that? Like, why does California matter uh, in comparison to the rest of the the world? Well, as is often, you know, reminded that we are the fifth biggest economy in the world, and on some level, we're we're all have sense of nation state um, with the, the power of our economy, the power of our technology, uh, the power of, of industries, um, also like Hollywood and, and other interrelated industries. We um, are have a huge impact on the world. And maybe I'll just share a story from my own little town of San Luis Obispo, which is just under 50,000 people, just by way of example of the impact that cities and uh, in, in California and the state of California has had on the world. San Luis Obispo was the first city in the world to ban smoking. And now we right. see that policy is ubiquitous throughout the globe. And so those are the kind of leadership policies that the state of California has been known for in the past, and that those of us at Let's Green California and, um, and all the uh, partners uh, working for climate justice and climate solutions here in California know that California can be again. You know, as you mentioned, you know, we think we're doing a lot here, right? We've done cap and trade. Governor Brown was really out in front on a lot of issues. Governor Newsom came out with, you know, kind of banning gas powered cars in, in 2035. But, you know, I guess you're not saying we're not doing enough kind of what more can we do, in your opinion? Yeah, so I think part of it is the speed at which we're doing it. So we do have some commitments, right, as you've noted, to some future dates. And I think one of the things that needs to happen is that we really need to speed that up. I mean, the science is really clear that the, the pace at which we're implementing these policies is not on par with what's actually needed to happen from a physics point of view. And so that's part of it. Um, and so, for example, we have an Electrify California piece of legislation that we're working on right now that will be reducing about one third of all the greenhouse gases that are emitted right now from the transportation and the built environment space. I was heartened to hear President Biden at the Conference of the Parties at the COP in Glasgow, I believe yesterday in his opening remarks, mention the importance of methane. This is an aspect of climate change and, and greenhouse gas emissions that has not up until recent times been mentioned enough. And now we know that methane has about 86 times the greenhouse gas 
impact of as of carbon dioxide. And so the impacts are more short lived, but they're they're huge in the short term. And so what we're going to be looking at is removing um, some of that methane from the built environment um, to electrify your homes and electrify um, your transportation through through EVs and incentivizing programs and other things like that. So we're really wanting to put um, power back in the hands of, of individual Californians, both in the literal sense, you know, getting their power in a way that is not going to be causing them harm, but also in the political sense and really working with our folks in environmental justice groups and really wanting to center, center working people um, in, in industries that are going to be impacted by this transition away from, from toxic fossil fuels. You know, I guess, I guess just to put it in perspective, you know, there's always talks of, oh, we need to roll back to 1990 levels or, or this year levels kind of, I, I, I guess just to, in, in, in your mind, kind of, where do we need to be in terms of total green gas emissions, uh, you know, as a state or as a country and kind of where are we currently? That's such a great question. And, and I appreciate the, like the need for specificity on that. And so I, you know, <laughs> my impulse is always, we need to keep it in the ground right now. I mean, and, and, and quite, you know, and, and, and I recognize that that's not doable and that sounds maybe extreme to some, and there's so many other things that have to go with that. Right. And as I said, including absolutely supporting working people through that transition and folks that are really experiencing those firsthand impacts currently. Um, so I recognize that, that, uh, that that's not doable literally right now, but it is also true that we need to treat this like the emergency that it is. And so, you know, you hear people say, you know, when you're in, when you're in a situation, you've dug yourself in a hole, the first thing you need to do is stop digging. So I really, I really think we need to look at it really it's speeding up the timelines for no more permits for fossil fuel um, extraction in, in the state. Um, but more importantly, and that's what I'm excited about with our legislation, we're really talking about creating the world that we want, you know? So we're talking about electrifying um, transportation and the built environment um, and making those outdated toxic fuels unnecessary essentially too. So I think it's a both. I think we really need to look seriously about permitting and things like that while we also um, look to electrify California and decarbonize and remove methane um, as much as possible, as quickly as possible. You know, there's been a lot of talk, at least on this show and kind of just, uh, you know, on the internet and everywhere, just kind of like, how, how do we get to this renewable energy kind of future? And there's a lot of, you know, talk about how storage isn't there yet. So, mm. you know, there's a lot of talk of, you know, what's wrong with natural gas? You know, it, it burns clean. What's wrong with nuclear? Um, can, it, can you kind of address those two topics and kind of, I guess, where we are at kind of with the possibility of kind of using renewables and, and storing their, their energy? Yeah, so I think the first thing I'd, I'd want to say is that I think that's the kind of thing that Governor Newsom making a really strong statement that has real meaningful commitments underneath it can be a game changer. You know, it's that classic moonshot idea. You know, when President Kennedy said we're going to the moon, we didn't have every single detail understood, but that level of commitment allowed for all of those things to fall in place. And so I think that that is, has been one of the missing pieces because we have the technology. Um, do we need more of it? Absolutely. Is it all perfect yet? No. Um, but I, we, if Governor Newsom and, and the California State Legislature makes that kind of commitment, we know that those pieces will fall into place. Right here in my own backyard, um, I'm uh, about 10 miles away from Morro Bay here on the Central Coast, and they are going to be... Um, hosting um, a huge battery uh, facility right here on the Central Coast. Um, also right here, we have the last operating nuclear power plant um, that is uh, at the beginning stages of, of being decommissioned. And in terms of that, um, I think that, you know, I just don't think that there is, my sense is there's not the political will to pursue nuclear. And there's a lot of um, embedded carbon emissions in the construction of nuclear power plants. And so in terms of an overall carbon conversation about nuclear, that's a very um, complex conversation that I'm not sure the, the people of California um, are interested in large parts in, in having, although I know I'm hearing that more and more, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, and the thing about methane gas is that 
not only is it toxic in terms of its impact on our on our climate, which we see every day with droughts, fires, um, et cetera, but it's toxic in and of itself as you're using it. So when you are going into your kitchen and turning on your gas stove, you are that is emitting toxic gas into your stove right where you and your children are. And so that's an additional reason that it should be a point of concern for folks that um, in addition to the significant impacts on climate crisis, it's a toxic substance in your home right now. And I think another thing that people don't um, always connect the dots about is that uh, methane gas is the byproduct of fracking. And fracking is, I think, detrimental and dangerous in multiple ways, not the least, least of which is that it puts our precious water at risk. And in a state that's famous or maybe infamous for seismic activity, it has a direct increase and in impact on, on um, earthquakes. And again, being in the backyard of the last operating nuclear power plant in the state, which is on um, fault lines right here on the central coast, it makes me incredibly concerned and nervous to um, see the continuation of fracking um, because I just think it, it, it there's so many multiple dangerous aspects of fracking and then of its product, uh, methane gas. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess with a new legislative session coming up here in, in 2022, kind of what, what some of the goals you guys are looking to achieve and kind of, I guess, how are you going to measure success for your green initiative? Yeah, so we're working now, we're getting input from folks that we want to make sure that we're including, as, I, as I've said, um, folks in, that, are, that have an environmental justice lens, uh, folks in the labor community, two, two groups that have to be included at the table in all of these conversations that sometimes get shut out. We want to make sure that we don't have any blind, so blind spots in our legislation and that we're being mindful of all of the impacts um, to all of those groups. And so we're getting a lot of feedback right now. Um, and so our legislation is called Electrify California. And essentially, it's a sort of a grassroots, a bottom up way of um, electrifying the home. So as I said, um, heat pumps, uh, induction stoves, um, and electric vehicles predominantly, and really wanting to put those incentivize those incentives in people's hands right off the bat. So we know a lot of times, especially for people in low or very low income communities, there is not the economic um, capacity to wait for a tax rebate or any kind of rebate. We want to get these incentives into people's hand at point of sale so that these options are as accessible and affordable as possible. Right. And then eventually those would we would be looking at um, starting with incentives and then looking towards more of a regulation um, endpoint that would eventually um, make it so that the, the built environment would need to have, um, would need to be electrified. Interesting. And, you know, I guess it's, it's kind of like just changing the consumer uh, perspective on things. You know, we were taught that gas uh, is so good with cooking and heating mm -hmm. and things like that, just changing our perspective. Um, you know, I guess, is, are the products out there right now, are they already being developed to, I guess, meet this new demand that you guys are looking to create that are going to kind of switch the consumers around to kind of wanting to, to use these new products in a different way? Yeah, that's a great question. And so we are working with folks that are manufacturing in those industries to understand when is it reasonable to say, for example, that the all, all homes have to have electric or induction stoves. So obviously, we don't want to put a goal out there that the industry itself can't handle in terms of production. And so we are currently working with those industries to understand that uh, manufacturing landscape in more detail so that we can be um, you know, practical and pragmatic with those goals. And I think another piece, and you're sort of getting to it, that needs to happen is a lot of education. As I said, most folks don't understand the immediate toxic impacts in the home when you turn on your gas stove. And I think there's a lot of education that would be really useful for people to do around that. And you're right, people do cling to fire for cooking. I think we've right. been cooking with fire since the beginning of time, right? And so there is a strong association there. Um, but luckily the new technology, the new induction stoves work beautifully. Um, home chefs love them, professional chefs love them. And I, you know, every new technology takes a little getting used to, but um, I think it's something to, to be excited about. You can still cook your delicious dinner without um, 
inviting toxic methane gas <laughs> into your house while you're doing it. Yeah. It's always funny when the heater kicks on because, you know, it's getting cold here in Sacramento. So the heater's kicking on a little bit and you do smell that kind of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't sound that like smell like the healthiest thing. And that's just, it's just yeah. the heater, right? <laughs> that's just the way it is. But I guess it doesn't have to be that way. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, and, and this is rare, but nevertheless, it does happen. The, you know, every once in a while, there are serious problems that end with people's, you know, explosions that right. end, end in fatalities also with, with methane gas um, coming into your house. And so that's a, that's a small fraction of the concern, but obviously those, that's a very um, detrimental potential outcome that, that, that there's no need for at this point. I'm, I'm ready for the uh, electric radiant heat floor future. Yes. <laughs> Well, yes. <laughs> Heidi, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, yeah. we've learned a lot about the uh, Green Initiative and I uh, hope to catch up with you later on and uh, see how you guys are doing. All right. Thank you so much. Right. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye-bye.